and mouse. Okay. Um, right. So um, today I'm going to talk about uh, a project that's been going on for many years across uh, multiple different labs, um, but it's finally nearing completion. Um, so actually, we just uploaded um, a bioarchive preprint last week. So for anyone interested to learn more, um, you can have a look at our preprint, um, which is down here. And, and we're interested in any comments you might have. So to entice you to look at it, um, I'm actually going to leave this link here at the bottom of the screen throughout the talk. Um, but the question we've been trying to answer um, is how brain wiring changes after birth. Um, because during development, the nervous system faces multiple challenges. Uh, new circuits need to be built to support new functions. Existing circuits need to be maintained despite a changing anatomy. And uh, to adapt and learn, circuits must be optimized to a fluctuating environment. So several genetic and cellular factors have been found uh, that cover maturation of individual synapses, but principles that describe the synaptic chains across the entire circuits or entire brains are missing. Um, and that's where the worm comes into the picture because we can actually look at the entire wiring diagram or connectome rather than just partial circuits. And John White and colleagues first showed that this was actually possible uh, many years ago when they reconstructed the adult hermaphrodite connectome for multiple partially overlapping animals. Um, but a single connectome represents a static image of a nervous system that has to be highly dynamic throughout life. With a static map, the plasticity and variability of the connectome is still unknown. So to understand how the connectome changes across development, we have to acquire the connectomes of many animals across different life stages. And Z elegans is optimal for this, not just because it's small, but because of the stereotypic, uh, the stereotypic cell lineage that allows direct comparison of every neuron and its connections from one individual to another. Um, so our aim was to reconstruct the connectomes across all post-embryonic life stages from birth or hatching uh, to adulthood in order to understand how and why connectome changes across maturation. Um, to do this, we developed a high throughput serial section electron microscopy pipeline. And uh, here I'm just showing one example of what an electron microscopy image looks like. Um, so here we can see, where's my mouse? We can see individual uh, neurons. Some are smaller, some are bigger. Um, we can see chemical synapses, which are evident by a presynaptic uh, vesicle pool a presynaptic density and one or more postsynaptic partners. Um, and because our samples uh, were prepared by high pressure freezing, preserving the ultra structure of the tissue, we can see uh, intercellular details like dense core vesicles uh, indicating modulatory neurons releasing neuropeptides. Um, we can also see gap junctions, but their identification is, is often more subjective. So um, they're excluded from any of the analysis I'm talking about today. So when we stitch many of these images together, um, we get something like this volume, which hopefully looks okay through Zoom. Um, if not, um, you can download the actual video on, on BioArchive. Um, but anyway, this volume consists of about uh, 5,000 images of an adult hermaphrodite brain, which um, we consider to span the nerve ring and ventral ganglion uh, neural pill anterior of the sublateral commissures. Uh, so here, every neural process and muscle fiber of the brain have been segmented. And we focused on the brain as it uh, contains the majority of neuron classes and where most decision-making happens. Um, so the volumetric reconstruction here was semi-automatic, meaning that the first pass of filling was done by machine learning algorithm, followed by uh, quite a bit of, of human proofreading. Um, and each cell here is, is colored by its type. We have sensor neurons, interneurons, motor neurons, modulatory neurons, and muscles. And we define uh, here modulatory neurons by uh, their prominent presence of dense core vesicles in the EM, as we saw just before, or a uh, known expression of, of monoamine neurotransmitters. Um, and finally, as we'll see just in a second, we didn't just segment cells, but we actually annotated synapses as well. Um, and, and to avoid um, the being subjective, we made sure that uh, three pairs of eyes looked at every single synapse. Um, so we could be, be more certain that, that when we see a synapse or when we report a synapse, it's actually a true synapse. Um, so basically we did this for several, um, for eight brains across development, eight C elegans, brains of isogenic animals. 
um, as we can see on, on this timeline down here. Um, and you may have noticed that, that we didn't actually reach our goal of reconstructing every life stage because we don't have an, an L4 animal. And we did actually image an L4, but it turned out to be a spontaneous male. So obviously we couldn't include it um, in, in our analysis. Um, but we do have enough data sets to examine how synaptic connectivity, uh, the shape and size of each neuron, as well as the proximity contact um, between each neuroid uh, changes across maturation. Um, so one thing that was immediately obvious from uh, this visualization here is that the nervous system is getting bigger without changing uh, in overall shape. So we can quantify this uh, by looking at individual cells, um, such as, for example, AIZ here, and uh, measuring the length of each neuroid, as well as the physical contact uh, between cells. So the total length of all neurites uh, throughout the brain um, increases quite a bit, uh, fivefold. And this growth is mostly proportional such that the physical contacts between cell pairs are mostly persistent throughout life. Um, so the contacts that we see in NL1 are, the one, are mostly the same as the one in the adult. So there are a few exceptions uh, of neurons that do grow out new, new minor branches, and many neurons grow out these tiny spine-like protrusions, um, which some of them you might uh, see here a little bit. They're fairly small in this picture. Um, but the overall shape and relative size of neurons in the brain is maintained after birth. And in parallel, in parallel to neuroid growth, there is an extensive formation of synapses from L1 to animal, which can see if, if we plot um, the connectomes of graphs, where each circle here represents a cell and each line represents the synapses between cells. So from L1 to adult, the total synapse number increases um, almost sixfold. And if we look close at one of these connectomes um, here, I think there's the L2, um, we can clearly see that each cell, um, clearly see each cell and we can clearly see the connections between cells. So um, here, it's important to distinguish connection and synapse. Um, so we define a connection as being all the synapses between two cells. Uh, so some connections, uh, like this one, consist of more synapses and are therefore stronger than, than other connections consisting of, of fewer synapses. Um, so the addition of synapses during maturation creates many new connections, meaning that synapses are added between cells that were not connected before. And the addition of synapses also strengthens existing connections, meaning that the number of synapses per connection increases. So even though the physical layout of the brain is stable, synapse formation um, is actually not simply proportional to account for growth. Um, and I'll show you that in, in three different contexts, um, that both the creation of new connections and uh, the strengthening of existing connections do not happen uniformly throughout the brain. So first, um, if we look at the creation of new connections, um, one long-standing hypothesis in developmental neuroscience is that synapse formation is simply driven by the physical contact between two cells. So according to this model, neurons uh, sharing um, a large contact area, like for example, these two neurons here, are more likely to build uh, new synapses than other contact areas that are smaller. And so to determine if this was actually the case, uh, we measured the contact area between every single cell uh, pair at birth. So we divided the contact area um, and then measured or counted the probability uh, of a new connection happening at the contact area. And what we saw is that um, there was indeed a positive correlation um, indicating that contact or the contact area is predictive of a new synapse or a new connection forming later in life. Um, so the physical contacts formed at birth appear to create a constant scaffold uh, within which network formation can unfold. A second form of non-uniform synapse addition was evident between neurons. So from birth, it was already evident that some neurons have far more connections than others, which I've been trying to represent here with this little sketch. Um, so we considered that the possibility that some neurons were simply more likely to build new synapses, um, in which case we'd see neurons with already many connections at birth disproportionately make new synapses compared to other neurons. 
this idea is, is also can also be simplified to uh, the rich get richer. Um, so consistent with this idea, we found that the number of connections that a neuron uh, has at birth is, is correlated with the number of new input connections that they receive later in life. So every single dot here is, is one neuron. Um, but surprisingly, neurons with more connections at birth were not more likely to add new output connections. So new connections only converge onto these highly connected neurons. And similarly, neurons with more connection at birth are also more likely to disproportionately strengthen at dis existing input connections, but not output connections. So the matur so maturation focuses the flow of information. Oh, there's an arrow. I don't know where this arrow came from, but I'll just ignore it. Um, so uh, maturation um, focuses uh, the flow of information onto the most highly connected neurons at birth. Or said in another way, highly connected neurons become better integrators of information, but not broader communicators of that information. Just went over two different ways that synapse annotation is, or synapse formation is not uniform across the connectome. And, and we also found a third one when comparing the relative strengthening of neurons inputs and outputs. Um, so we correlated the number of synapses for uh, inputs to the same cell, uh, outputs to the same cell, and uh, connections between different cells. And I'm going to show the, the result in a, a little bit of complicated plot here, but the y-axis, um, which is the coefficient of variation of synapse number, is simply, um, it simply means how different the synapse number is between two connections. So over time, unsurprisingly, connections to and from different cells diverge in synapse number. Um, the same is the case for inputs to a cell. But interestingly, the relative strength of outputs from a cell are mostly maintained. Um, the contrast between inputs and outputs, it's most clear if you just take the difference between the two, um, which is shown in, in the plot down here. Um, so the relative strengths of outputs but not inputs are maintained across maturation. Or said in another way, each cell regulates the strengthening of its own synaptic outputs, but does not dictate the relative strengthening of its input. Um, so in summary, so far, um, the maturation of the connectome is not simply uniform, but follows certain principles that are evident at the level of individual neurons. Um, and here, just the three, um, principles I just went over. But these principles are derived from overall statistical analysis of anonymous neurons. And one of the beauties of, of the worm is that we can actually identify individual cells across different animals, so we can examine exactly which connections between neurons actually change. Um, for example, if we look at a sensory circuit, such as this one, which includes uh, the major neurons involved in olfaction and thermal sensation, uh, we can examine how uh, it requires a cross development by looking at each connection one by one. Um, so here it's shown in, in one of our L1 data sets, L3 and one of our adults. And what should be evident here is that some connections, such for example, the connection from AFD to AOI are stable across development. Um, some connections such as the one from AWA to AFD uh, show a significant increase or decrease in synapse number in a stereotype manner, sometimes even forming new connections or eliminating existing connections at a specific life stage. Um, other connections, such as the one from um, AFD to ASZ here, which is almost uh, invisible because it, it, it's so weak, um, they're variable. And they exhibit no consistent trend in their changing synapse number, and they're not present in every animal. Um, but these variable connections are surprisingly common, uh, making up almost half of all connections in the adult connectome, and actually about the same number uh, variable as stable. Uh, this degree of variability contrasts with the widely held view that the C. elegans connectome is hardwired. Now, variable connections are typically weak, consisting of few synapses. So if you count up the total number of synapses in different, type, different classes of connections, the stable, um, most, most synapses are stable, but variable synapses still make up about 15% of all synapses in the brain, so they cannot simply be ignored. 
And before moving on, I want to emphasize this point because I think it's especially important to any worm people looking uh, at the connectome for a mechanism to explain their behavioral data. Um, because of variability, the synapse is annotated in any one connectome may not exist in the animals you're actually doing experiment with. Um, so I would also always recommend looking at more than one connectome to make sure that the connections that explain your data actually exist across multiple individuals. Um, and in addition, although most variable connections are weak, some consist of many synapses. Um, so you cannot simply set a synapse number threshold in an attempt to, to exclude variable connections. Um, for example, if you exclude all connections weaker than five synapses, which are these two uh, points here, um, you're removing the majority of variable connections, but there's still about a 10% chance that a connection you're looking at is variable. And you're also excluding um, a, lot of, a lot of stable connections going from here to there. So setting an arbitrary threshold can be dangerous. Um, and if you're thinking, that's great, but, but how do we actually browse through your connectome and other people's connectomes? We've developed this uh, small little app called Nemonote, which is um, online. Um, where you can see which connections are present across different animals. Uh, so for example, here the synapse number for our two adult data sets uh, for the neuron AFD. Uh, and as you can see, some connections um, like this one are only present in, in one animal, but not the other. Um, so you probably don't want to use these connections to explain your data. And right now it's, it's only our connectomes that are on here, but we're also planning to add other people's data. Um, so you should be able to, to see um, all the, the connectomes available. Um, anyway, that was a bit of a tangent. Uh, getting back to a research question, um, we had classified three types uh, of connections, uh, variable, stable, and developmentally dynamic. And we want to know whether these connections were evenly distributed among cell types. Um, so first, we looked at the proportion of uh, variable connections um, for each cell type. And cell type here being sensor neuron, modulatory neuron, interneuron, or motor neuron. Um, and we found the variable connections are most common among modulatory neurons and least common among motor neurons. This non-uniform distribution of variable connections suggests that variability is in some way regulated and may be functionally important. For example, as a source of behavioral variability. Uh, the high stereotypy of synapses for motor neurons may reflect a requirement for high fidelity in circuits for motor execution. Modulatory neurons, which can secrete monoamines and neuropeptides by volume release, may have the weakest requirement for precise positioning of synapses because uh, they can exert long-range effects. Uh, next, we asked if developmentally dynamic connections, which are the ones that change across maturation, are evenly distributed throughout the connectome. Um, so we wanted to compare for each neuron type the proportion of stable versus the proportion of development dynamic connection. So excluding variable connections here. So we again group cells by their type, uh, this time visualized uh, a bit differently as a graph where each arrow indicates uh, all the connections going from the cells of one type to another. Um, and if we color here every single arrow by the proportion of developmentally dynamic connections, we found that developmentally dynamic connections are distributed throughout most layers of the network, but most changes are seen at the periphery of the connectome in the sensor layers, the motor modulatory layers, and um, between from motor neurons. And in contrast, the communication within the interneuron layer at the core of, of the connectome um, is remarkably stable. Um, we think that changes in, in the sensor circuits may reflect changes caused by learning and memory, whereas changes in motor circuits may reflect adaptations to the changing musculature of a growing animal. Um, the stability of the core parts of the nervous system across maturation implies that the central processing unit is robust enough to be used in multiple different contexts. Maturation changes the flow of sensor information into the central processor and changes the readout of motor execution from the central processor without changing the central processor itself. Um, so to briefly sum up again, we've observed patterns of synaptic chains which are evident at the level of individual neurons as well as patterns evident at the level of neuron types. Um, but finally, we wanted to ask um, if the collective set of synaptic changes lead to changes in information processing at the level of the entire brain. Um, so first, we examined the directionality of information flow. Uh, 
in the brain. We classify connections um, from sensory to motor layer as feed forward, connection going in the, connections going in the opposite direction as feedback, and connections between neurons of the same type as recurrent. Um, across maturation, uh, stable connections, the stable connections that are feed forward were preferentially strengthened uh, more than feedback, stable feedback connections um, and recurrent connections. Um, additionally, if we look at the developmentally dynamic connections, um, the ones that are added um, at some point during maturation, they're more likely to be feed forward and the ones that are weakened or removed are more likely to be feedback. So together this results in the connectome becoming increasingly more feed forward biased. So one global pattern of brain maturation increases signal flow from sensation to action, making the brain more reflexive with age and less reflective. Another global pattern of, of brain maturation um, that we found was evident uh, when we examined the community structure of the brain. So we used weighted stochastic block modeling to group neurons of similar connectivity into distinct modules. Um, and we did this for, for each of our data sets. Um, so we found that the connectome becomes more modular across maturation early in development. There's two or, or three or four modules and in the adult there's about six. So synapse formation progressively increases the community structure of the brain as subnetworks for sensory or motor processing gradually emerge with maturation. Um, and interestingly, these subnetworks are actually spatially organized in the brain, uh, reminiscent of, of brain lobes in, in larger animals. Um, as you can see here, but it's a side point. Um, so to sum up, we've uncovered principles of synaptic remodeling at multiple levels of the connectome. At one level that applies to individual neurons in the brain, we've observed patterns of synaptic remodeling that altered the number and strength of all connections. Um, at a second level, we observed synaptic remodeling that differed between cell types. And at a third level, we observed network changes that altered the di directionality of information flow and the segregation of information processing throughout the entire brain. Um, and before I end, um, I need to stress that a lot of people have been involved and in, worked on this project and, and I don't have time to mention everyone by name, but I wanna thank everyone. Um, including, but not limited to, my lab, the Samuel Lichtman and Shavit labs, and um, of course my supervisor, me. Um, right. And then I'm happy to take any any questions. All right, thank you very much, Daniel. Um, so now that everything is deactivated, uh, the only way to ask questions is through the chat box. That should still work. Uh, so yeah, if you have any question, uh, feel free to ask them. Just a detail, maybe you said it and, and, and I missed it, like how, how many sections does the, does the, uh, like an agile brain represent? Sorry, could you say that again? Uh, like how many TEM sections did you use for, the, for reconstructing everything? Um, so it, it differed per animal. Um, it differs. Um, and so some of our animals collected by TM, some are by SEM. Mm -hmm. um, for the adult that I showed a video of, it's about 5,000 images um, with about, I think on average five images per section because these are big images. So 700 sections, which is fairly small that because it only covers uh, the nerve ring. Um, we had other animals that um, actually cover the entire animal and it was cut um, from tip from tip of the nose to the tail and those are up to 5,000 sections. Um, so it, it depends on how much you're cutting and at what angle you're cutting and how thick the sections are. Oh, that's impressive work. Um, so there is one question from Eviatar Yemini. Um, is there any plan to extend the EM annotation outside the nerve ring as well? Yes, there are many, many plans. Um, in the short term, um, we have collected an entire L1 animal that basically covers the entire animal. And um, we're working on um, getting 
getting that out, not just having the nervous system, but also looking in detail at muscle, glia, maybe other cells as well. Um, in the long term, um, we're working on scaling this up so we can do entire animals and we can do many animals and, and uh, hopefully in different conditions. So we can do um, what we call experimental connectomics. Um, you have another question from Kara Weisman. Um, I'm wondering if different morphologies of the different neuron could explain any of this pattern. For example, in the rich, get richer finding, are those neurons larger, such as their contact area is large? Uh, is larger, increasing P new connections, and something similar with the neuron type specific change over time? Yeah, it, it's a good question, right? So, neurons that are bigger, obviously, you would expect those to have more. Um, more synapses. Um, so specifically for the rich get richer, if you do, if you instead of looking at the relative number of synapse increase and just look at the um, density, so how many synapses there are per micrometer cable length and right length, um, you see the same thing. So for, for all things where uh, that might play, have a factor, um, how big the neurons are, we do the same thing, try it again for um, doing the neuron or synapse density rather than the synapse number. And then if we didn't see the same result, we wouldn't be confident about it. And we, yeah, so everything we showed has, has um, we have taken that into account. Uh, a question from Quang Blue. Um, have you done a comparison with the original adult connectome? Any no noticeable discrepancy? Yeah, so I get that question a lot, um, and and I don't have a good answer to it because it, it's hard, right? You have an n of one um, with the original connectome. You could say you have an n of two if you because um, they did actually do two nerve rings, but one was uh, an L four, one was an adult, um, and then we have two adults. Um, so. Obviously, there are differences. We, we see differences, but the differences from John White's connectome to our connectomes um, are about the same as the difference between our two adult connectomes. So we think the differences are within uh, variability. There aren't any major discrepancies. We think that they did, they were really careful and they, they did a really good work reconstructing the original connectome. Um, and so we know it, it didn't cover the entire animal. There are minor gaps in along the body that people later have tried to, to fix, but at least within the nerve ring, they, they did a really, really good job. Um, we have a question from Ulysses Ray. Uh, could you elaborate a bit on how you did categorize neuron into sensory, modulatory, inter and motor? Yeah, that's another good question. Um, so. Um, I'm not saying that the way we've classified each neuron is the best way to do it. There might be other ways that are better or in, in, in some, like depending on what you're looking at. Um, and so what makes it a bit complicated is that many neurons seem to have multiple functions. So there are neurons um, that both synapse onto muscle, which means you, would, you could consider them motor neurons, but they also have a clear sensory dendrite that makes, so they're sensor neurons. And so for many of these neurons that have multiple features, we always, we just selected the feature we thought were most prominent. Um, so um, an example is um, the neuron RMG, which um, you could consider uh, a motor neuron because it's an absent muscle. You could consider it a uh, modulatory neuron because if you look at it, it's basically only filled with these big dense core vesicles um, if you look in the, in the EM. And you could consider it uh, an interneuron because it, it's sort of, it's part of this uh, hub and spoke circuit that collects a lot of information between different types of neurons. And so, um, we have classified it as a modulatory neuron because if you look in the EM, it basically just shines out and basically filled with these tense core vesicles. Um, but it, I agree it is a bit subjective what you call it, but we tried to be as objective as possible and pick the feature we thought were most 
um, prominent. And we did that before we did any analysis. So we didn't go back and change to like interpret to get a different result. We, um, yeah. Uh, okay, um, last question from Vincent O'Connor. Um, wait, I lost it. Uh, there we go. Uh, what is the basis of the emergence of the body movement community in late development? What is the basis? Um, right. Um, so one thing that we tried to look at is which type of connections contribute to the emergence of these extra communities, right? So we have these different type, variable, developmental, dynamic, and stable. And it could be that either um, the stable connections are differentially strengthened, so some are strengthened more, and that creates more communities, or it's the addition of, of uh, developmentally dynamic connections. Or we also know that the variable connections are not evenly distributed, so they could also uh, contribute. And we find that it's actually the developmentally dynamic connections that mostly contribute to um, the, the new communities. So if you take out um, all connections, so you only have the stable ones left, you basically get the same number of communities across development. Um, and we're a bit surprised by that because developmentally dynamic connections, they only make up about 15% of all the synapses. So it, it's a small proportion of the synapses that contribute to this big change. All right. Thank you very much. I think for the sake of time, we're going to move to the, our next speaker. Uh, thank you again a lot, uh, Daniel, and sorry for I'm, the... I'm happy to share any, any or answer any more questions on, on Slack or, or elsewhere. That's a good, uh, a good option. All right. Yeah, thanks.